dying. I think a lot of people just, they see you run and they say, oh, it looks so easy. It's like hard work, staying there out, sacrifice. And it's so hard and a lot of people don't know. My coach always says, in a couple of years, we're not gonna have any trap because we're gonna take all of it home. Listen, the work is behind the scenes. Competition is the easy part. Giving away the Jamaican sprint secret used to dominate the 100 meter race. The thing is that Jamaicans have a secret running technique and it is hidden in plain sight. But if you don't know what to look for, you will never notice it, never recognize it, and never see it. At the end of this video, we will reveal it all to you. After intensive research, as well as witnessing many training sessions of Johan, Asafa, Usain, and Shelly Ann firsthand, this is the secret. In most countries, 12% of their professional athletes possess fast twitch muscle fibers, whereas because of colonization, 25% of the Jamaican population itself and up to 60% of their professional athletes possess fast twitch muscle fibers. Because of this, Jamaican genetics produce not only fast sprinters but also fast and powerful footballers and boxers. Both Mike Tyson and Floyd Mayweather possess Jamaican heritage in their genetics, Lennox Lewis and Leon Edwards in the UFC, and the list goes on. In fact, although Usain Bolt was listed as the first Jamaican man to win the Olympic 100-meter gold in 2008, as many as six other individuals, as far back as the 1990s and 1980s with Jamaican genetics, actually won Olympic gold and broke world records. They just happened to have been running for other countries at the time, such as the UK or Canada. One notable example is Linford Christie, a British sprinter of Jamaican heritage. He won the gold medal in the 100 meters at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. Hear ye, hear ye. Listen, Linford Christie here talking to you. Come to the Dwayne Chambers mini races at Lee Valley Athletic Stadium, 7th of July, from 2 till 4. <laughs> come and run fast, you know, you never know where you can be, fella. I might even come there and just surprise you. Another example is Donovan Bailey, a Canadian sprinter of Jamaican heritage. He won the gold medal in the 100 meters at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Ben Johnson, a Canadian sprinter of Jamaican heritage, set a world record in the 100 meters and won gold at the 1988 Seoul Olympics, though he was later disqualified for doping. Otto Bolden, on the other hand, is a Trinidadian sprinter of Trinidadian heritage who won medals in the 100 meters and 200 meters events at the Olympics, but he also has Jamaican roots as well. They weren't athletes who switched allegiance to those countries as adults. No, many were just random Jamaican kids who happened to have migrated with their parents, and they just happened to be faster than everyone in those countries when they became adults. It's not that Jamaica genetically engineered or bred prize fighters or speedsters, or is in the lab making genetically stronger and faster humans. Instead, it is a lucky or unlucky consequence of slavery and the slave trade. For a time, Port Royal, the Wicked City, and the wider Jamaica were known as the murder capital of the world. Because of this, of the slaves who did survive being forcibly hauled from West Africa across the Atlantic Ocean, in the worst conditions, in the dark, below the deck of Spanish and British ships, many of the most unruly, violent, and physically imposing slaves were always left in Jamaica. So, although they weren't brought from Africa for running or playing sports, Many of their physical and genetic traits equated to being good for playing sports in many of their future generations and descendants. So, it is because of this that most Jamaicans' genetic makeup and physical built can be considered as being pretty unique when compared to the rest of the world. Additionally, unlike the traditional European diet that was always based on small side dishes of vegetables and starch, which is also similar to the Asian and East African diets that surround beans, grains, and leafy vegetables, the West African diet, much like Jamaica's, was always heavy on ground provisions or heavy starches such as yams and cassava, and not just potatoes like the rest of the world. More than 30 varieties of yams are native to West Africa and are still regularly consumed by Jamaicans and West Africans even now. On top of this, Jamaicans regularly consume meat not just once or twice a week like most other cultures. No, Jamaicans consume meat once or twice per day, seven days of the week. Unlike most other places where breakfast meal items are distinctly different from lunch and dinner, 
Many of Jamaica's breakfast dishes would be considered dinner in other cultures. Even their side dishes would be considered an entire meal in other cultures. Because of this, Jamaicans have one of the highest calorie diets in the world, perfect for high energy athletic activities. Additionally, they have the best ways to cook and prepare these meals for them to be healthy. Both barbecue and jerk, which are ways to preserve, season, marinate, and roast or slow cook meat are native to the Caribbean and Jamaica, and all those traditional cooking methods have been passed down from ancient times. Additionally, after slavery was abolished, the indentured laborers that came into Jamaica, from places such as Asia, India, Syria, and Germany, all brought their own cooking techniques, which then mixed with the African and native cooking methods already present, which secretly and unintentionally makes Jamaican cuisine one of the best in the world. But even so, most people still would never put Jamaican food in the realm of Italian, French, Indian, or Chinese food. So, now that we have established that Jamaican genetics and diet are exceptional and naturally different from most other parts of the world, how does Jamaica then find and or nurture the raw natural talent that emerges from its population year after year? In communist type countries, you would have a situation where you take the kids from their parents when they are five, put them in some military type boot camp, and test their sprinting acumen. But that's not how Jamaica does its thing. It's about fun, excitement, festivities, dancing, and playing music. Unlike other nations, where running is just for leisure, in Jamaica, the annual sports day at schools is ingrained into every school and every community, and the entire nation comes to a stop. For sports day, if there are 2,000 schools on the island, all 2,000 schools have their sports day on the same day of the year, from the three-year-olds in kindergarten to the 18-year-olds in high school. Everyone has to participate whether they want to or not. They participate and are divided into age groups, classes, or houses. Even the teachers and parents will participate and compete. What this does is it gets every person from the age of three familiar with the basic concepts of a track, the lanes, the curves, the finish line, relay exchanges, and the experience gained from the pressure of winning or losing in front of a big crowd from when you are a toddler. By the time these kids get to age 12 or 13, they actually know if they are fast or not because they have already competed every year for the past five to eight years, both winning and losing. <laughs> Purple host again. Let me see the sound for you, Purple host. At the age of 13, this is where the first major transition happens. These kids are hitting puberty and can start to decide whether they will pursue track and field, football, tennis, basketball, etc. And they will also start to see and feel if they are getting stronger, taller, or faster. Additionally, this is where coaching, real coaching, now comes into play. All the running and jumping they did before in the years prior was just for fun, for PE and or sports day. It had no professional structure. It was all about fitness, coordination, rhythm, and vibes, and the energy of competing with raw talent. So, the reason for running, to many of these kids, would be all about things such as playing with your friends. On the way to a local community corner shop, you all race by saying whoever finishes last will be called a nickname, or they would be teased on the way back. That's just one of the endearing ways Jamaicans traditionally determine who is faster based on raw talent, but some other ways relate to practical things such as running from dogs, running for mangoes, or running to go fetch water. The prime candidates at the peak of their raw talent, at different age groups, is what all Jamaican coaches can identify with one look at any athlete. In Brazil or Spain, where football or soccer is king, the best coaches can spot exceptionally talented athletes at age 12 or even as early as age 8 and get them into a formal football academy of a big club. In America, the same is true for baseball, basketball, and the NFL, but in Jamaica, it's all about sprinting and track and field. The coaches at the top professional institutions and the top high schools can spot talent, and this is not because these coaches were trained outside of Jamaica. 
Instead, it is because they were under the tutelage of older Jamaican coaches, or because they were trained within the setup of Jamaica's local universities and coaching schools, such as GC Foster College, that have exceptional world-class coaching programs and courses. They understand not just talent as it is now, but what the talent can become in the future, and deploy methods to train athletes using natural gravity, mobility and bodyweight training, instead of lifting weights in a state-of-the-art gym which is why for training the teenagers left under their care, Jamaican coaches mainly utilize running up hills and train exclusively on grass rather than training on hard tracks, as these methods naturally prevent things such as muscle tear and shin splints, as well as prevent the athlete's growth from being prematurely stunted. Within these strategic training methods, Jamaican coaches mold these athletes into being able to perform and replicate the proper mechanical movements with perfect foot and hand placement, coordination, alignment, positioning and posture for each stage of a race. They do this in ways where all the required components of the movements can be easily transferred, displayed and absorbed to be honed and adopted by each athlete without their muscles being destroyed. As such, Jamaica does not train teenagers to become finished athletes within high school, as this would break their body, which is still developing and growing. So, most of the things the Jamaican coaches teach to the athletes at this stage of development is geared towards teaching them to become coachable which allows them to build an ego and a drive to win races, but to be humble and attentive when taking instruction from coaches without giving too much push back, as this will equip then for future learning and future development. Essentially, as a teenager, you as the athlete will only be thought isolated parts of, or an inferior version of, something much bigger, because the real thing in its entirety can only be handled by a fully mature body. As such, these developing athletes might be taught parts of the correct ways to start out of the blocks, or how to keep their bounce and turnover rate going while keeping a high knee drive with each long stride. This would be accomplished through thousands of repetitions of apple walks, frog jumps, butt kicks, high knees, etc., as well as hundreds of fork circuits around the track. Essentially, it would be you, the athlete, learning to mimic and visualize the movement and cadence of the technique until your body can handle the full version, much like Kung Fu, when you are being trained to master a secret family technique that has been passed down for generations. In Japanese tradition, the master teaches you the basics and give you a wooden weapon. Then years later, when your body and strength have been built up and you have all the individual movements memorized, the master would then reveal to you how to combine them all to face iron weapons. Now, the question everyone must be asking is, at the teenage years, where do these now well-trained and developing athletes put their newly acquired and developing skills to the test and compete at a high level to see how far their overall development has reached? That's where the annual Boys and Girls Athletics Champs comes into play. It is the longest-running high school athletics championship in the world. It's a clean It's essentially a week-long mini-Olympics that has happened every year for the past 100 years in Jamaica. Every professional athlete that you have ever seen running for Jamaica has competed at this championship at some point in their life. They might not have won it, and their school might not have won it, but they competed, and that's all that the Jamaican public requires you to do, to lace up the spikes and go compete in front of a stadium packed with 40,000 people. So, unlike other people in the world who just compete in their hometown in front of at most a few hundred people and their relatives, a Jamaican 15-year-old and even 13-year-old has to run all the rounds, heats, semifinals, and finals, just like they would at a world championship in front of 40,000 people rocking the stadium, with millions more online and on TV, many of whom are cheering for them to win, even though some might be hoping they would lose as well. Things like this give Jamaican athletes a mentality of steel and a competitive mindset, even before they are in their early 20s and actually have to compete at the real Olympics or even other championships. This is on full display when Jamaican teenagers have to compete against their wider Caribbean or American counterparts at events such as the Carifta Games, Penn Relays, and NCAA University Championships. By the time Jamaican athletes get to these meets, 
They are an epitome of grace, poise, confidence, and fearlessness. Their running form is perfect. No wasted motion, no body rocking, no hand flailing. Just bouncing and striding along effortlessly down the track, putting up ridiculous numbers and breaking records, utterly destroying the American high school athletes at Penns and racking up 90 to 100 medals, more than all the other nations combined at the Carifta Games. I believe Jamaica has won the annual Carifta Games for the last 40 consecutive years, that's just how dominant they have been over the rest of the Caribbean islands. But if the Jamaican high school athletes aren't actually the finished polished product, who is? That's where you get to the Merlene Audis, the Veronicas, the Usain Bolts, the Asafa Powells, the Shelly Anns, the Elaines, the Johans, and the list goes on and on. The people who train with the greatest coaches from the racers and MVP track clubs and work alongside the University of the West Indies and the University of Technology to get to perfection. It's about managing athletes who are confident, easy to train, managing their injuries, and training them to attain the perfect technique, pushing their bodies to near breaking point to reach those sacred heights. For the perfect technique, it's about seeing a person's body type. In the American context, it's about running like Justin Gatlin or running like Tyson Gay. One focuses on turnover rate, while the other focuses on stride length. But in Jamaica, the perfect sprinting technique is about both and all of the above. Most people don't know it and don't see it, but Johan, Asafa, Usain, Shelly Ann, Elaine, and Sharika all run the same way. They are all variations of the same thing. This is what a top Jamaican coach such as Stephen Francis or Glenn Mills will say to a young athlete. You're young in your professional career, so you are just learning what it takes, the methods of training, and just getting the full understanding of what the actual running form and running techniques will be. I believe your running form will one day look as good as Asafa. Your training partner might one day emulate Usain's running style, but what will it take to get you there? When you get it, it will almost be like being able to sit and ride a bicycle with your eyes closed, literally. This is the leg position and level of mobility you should aim for once you are out of your drive phase. The Americans tend to get it wrong, they try to create the shape of the number four with their trailing leg immediately as the other leg is planted. But the true technique is to get your body to be able to perform a butt kick and high knees simultaneously, and to continuously replicate this in a perfectly synchronized motion of fluidity. You are not ready for this technique, but in two years from now, we will try to reach it. So you are on a three-year plan to get to the next Olympics. With this running technique perfected, it will provide maximum power into the ground to push you along at top speed while maintaining the maximum turnover rate of your legs. These are the pictures of the Jamaican greats who have attained it, and you can see in these Olympic pictures only they are doing it, and only they have mastered the technique, even in these races that have exceptional athletes from other countries around the world. These are the speeches and talking points that top Jamaican coaches use, which helps to build and solidify the level of understanding between coach and athlete and gets the best out of both. For nearly two decades, Jamaica has held a tight grip on the world of track and field, with iconic athletes like Usain Bolt, Asafa Powell, and Johan Blake dominating the sprinting events. However, the secret behind their unparalleled success extends beyond mere physical prowess. It lies in a meticulous understanding of biomechanics, particularly focusing on pendulums, rotational inertia, torque, symmetry, and flexibility. Contrary to conventional wisdom, Jamaica's approach to sprinting places very little emphasis on trying to build bulky hamstring muscles for power. Instead, it prioritizes core strength, abdominal muscles, and lower back stability, recognizing that true speed is achieved through harmonious coordination of the entire body. In essence, the legs are only as potent as the core that supports them, highlighting the symbiotic relationship between strength and coordination. During the speed endurance phases of a race, as you near the finish line, your abs are the muscles that are lifting your legs to produce high knee drives, not your hamstrings. Observations of Usain Bolt's training regimen reveal a deliberate focus on mobility and flexibility, rather than traditional heavy lifting. High-intensity, fast-paced exercises, coupled with frequent stretching and massage sessions, emphasize agility and suppleness, crucial for executing the precise movements demanded by elite sprinting. Central to Jamaica's sprinting technique is the distinction between front-side mechanics and back-side mechanics. Unlike long-distance running, where the trail leg often lag behind, Jamaican sprinters maintain a forward-leaning posture, utilizing the hips as pivot points to optimize stride length and frequency. This technique relies on understanding the intricate interplay between muscle groups, 
particularly those involved in anterior and posterior pelvic tilt, to achieve optimal hip mobility and alignment. In the front side mechanics approach, the knees assume a pivotal role, driving upward in sync with the forward motion of the body. As the thigh reaches perpendicularity with the torso, the lower leg seamlessly tucks beneath the center of gravity, minimizing drag and maximizing efficiency. This dynamic interplay of rotational motion, torque, and pivot points mirrors the fluid motion of a pendulum, with each stride propelling the athlete forward with minimal effort. Achieving sub 9.6 second times in the 100 meter race demands a blend of ultra flexibility and core strength, enabling sprinters to elevate their knee drive while executing swift leg turnovers. By transitioning seamlessly from a high knee drive, then planting that leg for a fraction of a millisecond, then getting it immediately to a butt kick orientation, tucked beneath the athlete's center of gravity, the athlete's form would naturally ensure minimal ground contact time and optimize speed and ensure form is maintained throughout the race. Based on the basic laws of physics surrounding torque, rotational inertia and angular momentum, a tucked-in leg bent at the knee, positioned beneath the athlete's center of gravity, relative to the athlete's hip joint or main pivot point or fulcrum, is easier to attain maximum angular momentum than a fully outstretched or fully extended leg. In essence, Jamaica's sprinting prowess is not merely a product of genetic predisposition, but a testament to the meticulous application of scientific principles to athletic training. By mastering the art of pendulum-like motion and harnessing the power of rotational dynamics, Jamaican sprinters have redefined the boundaries of human speed, cementing their legacy as titans of track and field. Thus, Jamaica has both the current fastest man and woman alive in Usain Bolt and Elaine Thompson, and they also have the second and third fastest men and women alive, some of which they share with the USA. Unfortunately, many of these legendary Jamaican athletes will soon be retiring and will be attending their last Olympics in France. As such, what will the future look like for Jamaican track and field? Which up-and-coming athletes have the body type and mobility to replicate and preserve not just the sprinting legacy with winning medals, but carry on the sprinting technique of Jamaica. Asafa lost his ability to perform the technique because he had a long-term groin injury. Johan Blake was unable to replicate it because of his severe hamstring injury. Elaine had to manage ankle injuries while replicating the technique throughout her career. What all of this means is that, as long as the new youngsters or new Jamaican male and female sprinters that emerge can remain fit, then they stand a fighting chance of getting there to attain the same achievements of the legendary Jamaican stars of the past. So, let us name some of the young athletes who will be the most likely persons to replicate it. Brian Lavelle is one, his body type and posture and smoothness is that of Asafa, Sandra Davidson needs more mobility and flexibility, but he looks very similar to Usain Bolt in many ways, Tina and Tia Clayton will replicate the technique with the power of Shelley and Elaine, Brianna Lyston will replicate it as smooth as Audie and Veronica, and dominate the 100 meters and 200 meters in years to come. But even after that, you have youngsters like Nikoi Bramwell, who have broken some of the junior Carifta records set by Usain Bolt. Nikoi Bramwell possessed the poise, the form, and the technique to replicate some of what Usain Bolt has done. He just have to manage his injuries and to not get overworked by his high school.